like Wes said, now first I want to tell you that in the 70s, in the late 70s, early 80s, I worked in the gas field. And uh, we did a little bit differently than they do now. He told you about the dome that they drill into. Now I know probably by looking around the room, there's a lot of sports fans here, we know about football, we know what the end zone is. In the field, we call that the zone. Where the gas is, it's the zone. When you hit bottom, you key deep. Okay, back then we, we drilled to the zone and they produced the gas from that zone, no fracking. When that zone was depleted, and it may take 20, sometimes 50 years to deplete that zone, there was no water coming up hole. It stayed in the ground where it belongs. It was put there 60 million years ago, I think there was a reason for that. But, but let's keep it down there. And then if that zone does deplete, you just come in with what's called a completion rig or a workover rig. Drill to the next zone. Still, no fracking. Okay, now we, we own our mineral rights. So when they first came to town, now when I say we, I mean my father and his brother own the land. They're both in their 80s. And uh, when they first came in, they thought it'd be a pretty good deal. And I'm talking 1995 is when they started drilling on us. Now, most people here think it didn't start until 2004, 2002. We were the first 10 acre bottom hole space. Okay, we were in a federal drilling unit. That's what I can't remember what you guys call it, but it's a forced pooling area. Now they come in and they told us if we got 75% of the landowners sign in, we don't need to, we'll drill under you and steal your gas. Love the company to work with. So my dad, he figured it was worth it because for the first two paths, they gave him more than he paid for the land. Not by much, just a thousand dollars more than he paid for the land, but he bought it back in the early 50s. Now, they drilled the first hole south of, I mean, east of me a half mile in 2005, the first hole on our property in 2007. We've got 19 holes on our property now. There's a hundred holes within a mile of my house. There's a compressor plant a mile and a quarter from my house. There's another, there's a water treatment facility right next to that. There's another compressor plant a quarter of a mile north. Another one a quarter of a mile north of that. Now, we thought things would be good, you know. Might make a little money off the gas. Well, don't believe that because they don't live up to their contract. When you start getting your checks, they've got all kinds of weird fees on it. Now your contract says you get your percentage at the wellhead. Well, they change that when they start paying you. They charge you to move the water from the hole. They charge you to transport the oil from the hole. See, when the, when the gas comes up, they separate the water, they push it over in these condensate tanks. Through natural convection, the paraffin separates. Now, I don't know if you have paraffin oil here with your water west with... No, they're just producing gas. Pardon? Just, no. No? Here. Okay, so you guys won't have to worry about paraffin, thank God. But anyway, they pump the water off until there's probably 75% or 80% of the tank's paraffin, and then they pull that and call that an oil cell. But they also have their own facilities, and once that water leaves your property, they call it a waste product, therefore you won't get paid for it. Then they put it in their facilities and circulate it through other tanks and separate more paraffin off of it. But you don't get paid for that, they do. Because, you know, it was a waste product when they took it off your property. Now, uh, I really want to, I didn't really want to talk about that, but I think you all need to know that because I you know Rob, you're freaking lying, for my language. Like that, I just bought Jeff a beer. <laughs> but when, when they came in, okay, and, and they started going, we thought it'd be okay. But then around 97, 98, I started most problems with my livestock. Okay, I, I, I raise Appaloosa horses and goats. The mares started slipping, and I call it slipping, I guess the, the proper word would be aborting their colts at five to seven months. It's hell to go out and catch two horses. One's a live mare with a placenta hanging out of her, and the other one's the dead colt hanging on the ground. A little hard to get a little profit off that. And then I started getting headaches, dizzy spells, sinus problems. And I could be developing allergies. Hell, I was all 40 years old. Might be allergies. Who knows? Never had allergies before. Might have allergies. 
And then over the years, things got worse for me and for the lifestyle. In 2003, late 2003 through 2005, they had evaporation facilities around my house to evaporate frack water. Now, you know it's frack water when they put a ribbon around it like it's a used car lot. It's got the real brightly colored, you know, nice scene. Got all these red, white, blue, and yellow, and green ribbons all around. And then there's a big red sign, white and red sign in front that says, do not use. That's because, like Wes explained, the chemicals are proprietary. And they don't know it. Slower days chemicals will mix with Halliburton's, or Halliburton's will mix with Calfrax. So you don't know what's going on. Well, then, all these pits full of this frack fluid, in 2003, they put what, what I term as a floating irrigation system on top of them, EVAP, they call it. And they try to evaporate the water. O over on the table here, I've left some pictures of evaporation facilities that were around my house. It went from 2003 to October 2005. Now, during that time, I questioned the industry why they were doing it. They told me that water had already been through their water filter. Well, that water filter wasn't built and put online until November of 2005. One month after they stopped evaporation, there was no filter. In 2004, they cut a T in a produced water line. They put produced water, they transport it to the water filter plants and stuck it in a big poly line. That's to reduce the truck traffic on the road and the dust, you know, for our health. From 2004 on the east end of my property, they cut a T in that line, attached a piece of eight inch metal culvert to it, put it in the creek. They rip wrapped it, then put screen in it, then rip wrapped it again, because they expect a pretty heavy flow out of that pipe. When I asked them about that pipe, they told me that they were returning the water to the river after it had been through the filter. Now I've already explained that filter hadn't even been built yet. Another year and a half they built the filter. And I asked them a simple question. When they put that key in the line, they put no valve in it. How does that water, coming from several miles over and two other drainages, it came from Knuckle Creek, Mam Creek, West Mam Creek, and then down to the to the station. How did that water know to go past that key, down to that filter, and then come back again and put itself in the creek? God, water has a brain. <laughs> and they had water the I didn't know that. I, I always thought it just flowed on the ground. And I went down downhill. Like my dad said one time when they come up to regrade a pad, that we had a frack spill in 2005. They covered it up with dirt. When they came in in 2008, now they didn't get there until 2008 to clean it up, to fix the soil. They told me they cleaned it up. And what they did is put about two foot of soil over the top of it. They didn't clean it up. And in 2008, to get their attention, because they refused to answer their phone or return their phone call, I padlocked my gates. Be careful about that one. They'll call Homeland Security. They told me that was environmental terrorism. I told them when the federal officers come out to have them look down. Has anybody seen the film Gaslands? Mm -hmm. Okay, that moonscape that you see with the pads every quarter mile, that's my house. Welcome to my world. We've got 100 wells within a mile of my house. Over oh, there's another picture of a condensate tank. I think it's near the bottom. But if you look at the tank next to the barn, you'll see methane and produced water coming out the top of the tank. That's a daily occurrence. I probably can't commit suicide by sticking my head in an oven because I think I'm immune. <laughs> but please, nobody light a match. Mm -hmm. Because in 2004, my whole body seized up. I couldn't reach my face to eat. I couldn't walk. I couldn't drive. I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So I went to the doctor's and don't know what's wrong. I went to my physical therapist, don't know what's wrong. I went to the chiropractor, don't know what's wrong. I went to an acupuncturist or biologist. She clued right away that it took her 30 minutes, but she figured out that I'd been poisoned by gas. She didn't know if it was liquid or airborne, but it was gas and advised me to get a tox screen. This is my tox test. Okay, folks. 
Now, I lost my glasses the other day. I can't find my head when we lost. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I might take a minute. But I have benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, MP styrene, O styrene, xylene, and six kinds of te. Mm. I usually got this right off the top of my head. Triethyl uh, methyl benzene in my blood. Okay? Now, in 2003, I started having trouble with my livestock. I'm having enough trouble. Hell, I can't get around. Now, I was told that what I have is called peripheral neuropathy. Now, what that means is I've got permanent brain damage. I'm irreversible. Can't be fixed. That's me. Now let's talk livestock. Any of you own livestock? Anybody, anybody got livestock? Horses? Horses? Oh, I'm sorry. Goats? Anybody got goats? Cows? They're all ruminant. Okay. Well, my horses started slipping close, like I said, in 2000. Hell, 98, 99, I finally got rid of the mares. But at the same time, I was having a little trouble with them breeding. I had four gorgeous stallions. This scared you. All medicine hat. I don't know if you're familiar with the Appaloosa breed. Yeah. They're all medicine hat. I've got one that's medicine hat, medicine hand. Medicine man touched him. I'm pretty sure they're sterile. In 2007, a friend of mine brought up five of his mares. We had them all checked before we brought them up to make sure they were open, ready to conceive. After eight months, rotating a different stud out on those mares for a month at a time. One mare conceived. That spring she had a stud. Good looking son of a gun. Nice gray, big spots. I mean he showed everything. He had quartered up nice everything. Fifteen months later he died. But while he was alive we were a little concerned because he was a high flanker. Okay, or a high baller, people call it. His gonads never dropped out of his groin. Sometimes it'll be just one, sometimes two, because they can't show them, so it wouldn't show quality. But then at 15 months he died, so my friend and I cut him open. You know, you gotta find out where the livestock dies. He had no gonads. He had no testes. He had no cords. He had no reproductive organs. That's horses. Sad. What are you doing, Doc? They don't deserve a bullet. They got to live a little longer. I've got two stallions left. I've got three gildings. One of my gildings can only step about a foot at a time with his hind legs and he can't lay down. Because when he picks his leg up, the hawk comes out of place. When he sets his foot down, it pops back in. So he sleeps standing up because he probably can't get back up. When he does go down, I'm going to have to give him the bullet and bury another one. I think I do more work with my backhoe burying livestock than I do digging ditch. But that's enough for the horses. Let's go with them goats, okay? Damn it, goats. Good, tasty, tasty, tasty goat. Good milk, too. Until you got this crap. When you get this crap, you drink the milk. You seize up again. Everything stops working. I was told I could sell my goats, because, you know, people eat goats. Hell, I used to eat goats. But I, I've got a problem that oil companies don't have. It's called a conscience. I can't sell my goats. I can't give my goats away. I won't let anybody eat them. Those goats in 2003, now, Jeff told you I had a real barrel, Billy Goat. People called him the Golden Nubia. He was huge. He threw four kids out of Billy Goat. Three was the least he'd throw. My dad told me to shoot the goat. He said, you know, my dog only has two teats. She can't support but three kids at the most. Four, four is too many. You're going to have to shoot your billy goat. I said, no, nah, I ain't shooting him. I ain't shooting that goat. But then, when three out of four are born dead, or if they have three, two out of three are born dead, 
and the ones that do live end up with what I term as a type of lymph bone and attach their lymph glands under the head. See, mine might have been rock solid since 1999. Now, your lymph glands detox your body. Right? Good luck with that. Uh, haven't been able to fix that. I fixed a little of it, got moving again, but can't fix that. Uh, I got rid of most of them in 2007, sold them to a buddy of mine, sold 26 billies. I used to run 30 does, two billies. That would give me between 100 and 120 kids every year. You make a pretty good living off that. But when you only have 30 and you got to bury 90, ain't no profit. Nah. So I sold the does because some of my friends and some people I know that moved away from the area, they got a little better when they moved away, got out of the fumes, got out of the patch. I can't leave. I gotta take care of the livestock. I can't sell it. Who's gonna take it? I don't know, I don't know what I do with them. But they don't deserve a bullet. I'll let them live out their life and then I'll bury them. The goats I got rid of, we thought they'd do better when they got away from the place. Well, they still kept having stillbirths. And the does were dropping off two, three a year, four a year, five a year. They're all gone now. They're dead. So if you think natural gas is good, it is. But if you think fracking is good, you need to pull your head out. Because that's the nastiest crap that you'll ever deal with. And it'll never go away. Once it's in you, you're stuck with it. Now, these are the chemicals that might show up. But a lot of the fracking chemicals they use, first off, you can't test for them because they don't tell you what they are. But a lot of them go through your body, completely through your body, in 48 to 72 hours and cause their damage and leave. So you can't be tested. So, be careful. Uh, I just need to warn all of you that, you know, our, and your mineral rights owners, we own our minerals, but it didn't do us any good. I mean, true, we make a little bit of money, but the property is destroyed. My horses will not drink out of the creek. I depend on those horses to break the ice so the goats can drink. That's how nature works. This year they spent all winter breaking the ice out of my pond. Now we know that still water gets a lot harder than moving water, but they did it all winter. A week ago, a week and a half ago, they had to start drinking out of the ditch, the irrigation ditch, because the pond is about dried up. The pH level's way high. Scary high. Excuse me. Sure. Uh, excuse me, sir, I'm talking. I'm talking this time. Anyway, sorry for the interruption, folks. Uh, we came here to try to warn uh, the big gentleman here that's getting up right now. He said he's pro natural gas. Well, I want to explain something. When this started, I was a 200 pound man. Do I look like a 200 pound man? I'm lucky to hit 140 now, if I'm lucky. The things this stuff does to you will scare you. You can't move, you can't walk, you can't get around. My hands have been as big as a softball. Imagine your hand this big around, your fingers stretched out, but they still touch each other. You can't move them, you can't do anything with them. How do you feed your horses? You can't get a hold of a pitchfork. How do you clean your ditch? You can't hold a shovel. How do you feed yourself when you can't pick up a fork or a spoon or a knife or a glass of water? And it's not water anymore, folks. Crap ain't water. In the state of Colorado, in the revised statutes, the criminal code. Now, criminal code, let's, let's catch that, criminal code. This was enacted in 1952. Colorado Revised Statutes, 18 
120. If anybody wants to look that up and knows how to use a read a law book or use a computer. I don't do computers. I'm so old school. I do hard copy. The law says that any liquid which remains liquid at surface temperature on a gas location is drip gasoline. Not water, is it? But they won't enforce that because, you know, that would hinder the industry. They might have to tell the truth. And, and the thing is, when, when they hire water haulers, if y'all are going to be, if anybody here drives truck, I'm sorry, get yourself a lot of bacon soda and Epsom salts, put your two cups of each in your bathtub, just as hot as you can possibly stand to get in it, soak in it a minimum of three times a week, and you can pull some of the toxins out through your pores. I had to do it for three times a day for two weeks before I could move. It's, it's, it's not fun. It's scary. When, sorry, I lost my whole train of thought. <laughs> Uh, when water haulers go to work for a truck out there, they tell them they're going to be hauling water. First day on the job, they might come back and ask their employer, uh, you said we were hauling water. Like, yeah, yeah, it's water. Well, why is the water black? It's got a little carbon in it. Don't worry. Now, on the tanks, stenciled in six-inch letters, It'll have a sign that's stenciled, you know, spray paint. It's produced water. So it's water, right? Well, to one side of the tag will be a hazmat sticker, six inches by eight inches on it. It'll say, condensate contains benzene, causes nerve damage, dizziness, headaches, and death. That's water. On the other side will be another sign that says, produced water contains H2S in headspace of tank, tanker, and tank car. Which means when that stuff's coming off the top of those tanks over there, in that picture, that's H2S gas. It's the most deadly gas on the planet. Was H2S certified the first time in 1975, the last time in 1983? I can't remember exactly, I have a problem. At so many parts per million, everybody, everybody within 500 feet is dead. When the alarms go off on the drill rigs, and you know when they have H2S protection, you'll see a cylindrical tank beside the drill rig, usually painted orange, safety orange. <laughs> That's H2S protection for the roughnecks, uh, not for me and you, but for them. When the alarms go off on the rig, you grab a 30-minute backpack, oxygen pack, and run like hell to what they call a safety zone, minimum of 500 feet from the drilling platform. At that point, there will be an oxygen concentrator. When you get there, you count heads. If everybody's there, okay, now let's start shutting her in. Now, when I say shut it in, well, first off, let's go, let's go back a little. If everybody's not there, you go back in in groups of two with 30-minute oxygen tanks and you pull out the dead bodies because no one's alive. If they didn't get off that location, they're dead. Now, you won't hear about that from your local hospital because the oil companies have their own EMTs. They don't lose your local facilities because if they do, well, somebody might know what's going on. They don't want you to know because if you knew, probably wouldn't allow it. Now when I say shut the well in, anybody who's a roughneck knows what it is to shut a well in or to throw the BOP and close it off. Most BOPs don't work. We had an incident a couple years ago where it was blowing methane and water out the top of the Kelly hose. That's probably too technical. But blowing off the top of the drill rig and coming out the bottom of the drill rig for four days. Because out of four crews of five men, one tool pusher, one company hand, one drilling hand, one mud engineer, nobody knew how to operate the BOP blowout prevention device. We've all seen what happened to BP in the deep water, okay? But this is on land. So 
So we got straight methane blown out the top of a rig and off the side for four days. They waited on a crew from Texas to come show them how to operate their BOP. <laughs> it's supposed to be tested for it goes on well every time. Check and inspect it every time. A little bit of safety problem out there. Now, their problem was the hydraulic system didn't work. Well, when that doesn't work, there's a thing called a hero wheel. The name indicates why it's called that. One man goes underneath the substructure of the drilling rig and starts cranking that wheel by hand to first pinch off the pipe, solid, well casing and drill pipe. And then it'll shear the pipe off if you go to the shear rams and drop that pipe to the bottom of the hole. And then no gas will come out. It seals it off. Now, when you hit H2S and you have to shut a well in, you work under oxygen. You're wearing your packs. You go and you start increasing the viscosity and weight of the drilling mud. I know I'm getting technical, but what it does is you increase the weight. I mean, you increase the viscosity by using what they call gel. It's a mix of bentonite and some other chemicals. They also put caustic soda in their drilling mud to keep it from spoiling. When I say spoiling, we all have had gravy. You know how gravy gets when it sets on the stove too long, you get that skin on top of it. That's what drilling mud looks like when it spoils. Now they increase the viscosity of the mud with the mud, and then they increase the weight with a heavy metal called barroid, which is barium. And that kills the well, and then they cap it, and then they'll correct the problem if they can. My time's about up, so thanks for listening. I get a little carried away. You've heard a lot of horrendous stuff. I mean, it's really people crying and everything and stuff, and so. To like lighten things up a little bit, because this this has been so serious. But when we picked up Rick from the airport, because I'm a farmer, he's a rancher, so we got out on the farm there, and we found out that we both were good at profusely swearing. <laughs> the, the problem problem was that we we I said to Rick, I said. <laughs> and the problem is, I said, we're going to have to be at a church in like an hour and a half. And uh, we're getting so good at the swearing, so, so then we try to come up with a strategy. And what happens is if he swears, he, he buys me a beer. And if I swear, I buy him a beer. And guess what? We haven't bought each other a beer. We're, we're curious. Okay? So... When it comes to like uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard, it's like if you think of that kind of a term, you, you think of a nuclear plant, a one source type deal that's over here. The problem with this technology is that they're going to put so darn many wells in it, front yard, backyard, you look out your window, you're going to see one. So that's different. Multiple, multiple sources, thousands and thousands of wells. And we're not against gas extraction. All right, if it can be done safe. I was in our first movie talking to Tony and Graffia, or Dr. and Graffia from Cornell, and he said they were working on ultrasound and laser for extraction of the gas. They got onto the hydrofract technique and then they ran with it because it was cheap. And they could get it up and boot it up and get it moving. And so I think we should be exploring these other possibilities because we, it's a resource that needs to be considered to be tapped, but we need to do it safely. And we can't have it that we're taking, when you have 95 miles by 95 miles by 95 miles of fresh drink of water left in the whole planet, and we're just shoving this down, three to nine million gallons per well. It's, that's kind of ludicrous. So that's one that, and, and 30 to, say, a third of it to half gets regurgitated back up, highly toxic, flow back. That's what we discovered frack because of the flow back. 
So I didn't know anything about this stuff about a couple years ago. She came running in with the newspaper at the farm up there in Poultney. And she said, you don't believe, look at this headline. They want to put a deep injection well. They want to put like a billion gallons for starters right underneath our town in the van at gas well. I said, this is insane. This can't be happening in America. But, you know, is this Chairman Mao's China? Is this Stalin's Russia? This, this is the United States of America. We can't do all this stuff. I didn't know anything about fracking. And then as we discovered, we were almost ready to be basically stuck with this thing. They had state permitting, federal permitting done behind our back because of a, a, town, a political leader in our town that was secretly dealing with these guys, this multinational corporation. And through Freedom of Information Act, we, um, it was uncovered some of his uh, conversations he had with these people. So they only needed to pass it through the town, <coughs> town board. And I remember walking into the town clerk and I said, can we see the information on this? They said, Dr. W, a very distinguished medical doctor, is looking at it over there. I said, we just don't want this in our town. We can't have this a half a mile from Cuba Lake, dump a billion gallons. This is insane. Dr. W came out, and he came out, and I didn't even know the gentleman, very distinguished. And he came up and he slammed the document about an inch and a half thick. And he said to, to Jody, and he put his finger in my chest, and he said, this is a done deal. They have everything with the state and feds already wrapped up. They only need to vote for the town board, so you're cooked. He said, I'm telling you this because I don't want most of people like you wasting your time and being frustrated. And so we got in the car. We were really disheartened. We slept on in the morning. We said, you know what? What if there's a small chance he's wrong? So that's when we went on the offensive. So four weeks straight, 15 hours a day, knocking on doors, putting ads in newspapers. We ended up racking up to 1,200 bucks. We notified by snail mail all the people along the lake because they were trying to sneak it in when the people that were along the lake were gone. These are very affluent, powerful people, some of them. So long story short, we tried to get a, a Congress, US congressman to come to Pulte. And he said, he said, so that's Super Bowl Sunday. I said, people are going to watch the game. They're not going to come to your little town. I said, I'll tell you what. I give $1,000 to the congressman's uh, charity. And if we don't pack our, our fire hall, 227 capacity, then he can. I'll give that money to the charity. And 10 minutes later, when I got the congressman called me on the phone, and he said, I like your style. It's inappropriate to have a gentleman's bet. But like, for money like this, so I'm coming. So then we got from there to Tony Agraffia, Richard Young, a geologist from the Sumi system, Tony, uh, Walter Hang, Rachel Trichler, an attorney. And we had really an all-star forum there. And they packed into our fire hall. Over, and we had five, after you get to 500, you can't fit anybody. They're near like sardines. And, pe and people said, people are sweating. I was sweating under my armpits. And this is 15 degrees Fahrenheit outside. So he said, open up all the doors, open up all the windows. That'll cool things down. And then the lady kind of like passed out. We took her out of the lobby. <laughs> so then we said some of the, the firehouse guys, they said, kick on the air conditioning. You don't realize how much, when you take a room about this size, and every square inch, there's somebody like this. And what happened is one of the elderly gentlemen in our town, he said, I won't let this thing happen in our town. He said, I'm a silver-haired revolutionary, and I'll throw myself in front of a toxic brine truck before I let that happen to this town. And then another elderly gentleman jumped up and said, I'll do the same. Then the congressman said, I'll do the same also. Well, within 24 hours later, he was brought up out in D.C on ethics charges. So it could be related to that. It could it might be it might not. So long story short is our town within two weeks won against it, one of the more powerful multinational corporations on the planet. When people show up, you can go around the corporatocracy, they're throwing their money down in Albany. They have lobbyists and there's and they're just loading these people up down there, these politicians. 
When you run, we're going to make sure that you get reelected. Whoever runs against you, we're going to destroy them. And we're going to do it through the Chamber of Commerce. We're going to be clever. We're going to cover our trail. And we're going to subvert the American experiment, which is democracy and the people's will. How many people here, if I ask you this, have been doing this all week, do you think that Albany is serving you, your, your needs, your interests? <laughs> okay, so all parts. <laughs> I never gotten a hand all week from anybody. Now, yeah, my um, my wife and I's feeling is, if you are a citizen and you 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 writing your legislator, you email and you're showing up, you're doing your petitions and everything, you're working for years on this. And Albany's about ready to close. And do we have anything in our hand from these guys from Albany? Anything. The moratorium's about ready to run out. And what do we have? Nothing, if you ask me. That's a subversion of our democracy. And that epic no frack event that's coming up on Saturday on June 25th. We need, just like the French did, 10,000 French showed up against frack. And they banned the frack. You need the people power muscle. And we brought in the biggest lineup that's ever been on the planet. I say that modestly. 48 speakers coming from all over the world even. Six movies and 10 musicians. It's, we charge in this on credit cards. It's a free admission. We're going to pass buckets around. That's 15 grand. I try to put, try to put our mouth, our, our money where our mouth is. So, I'm a simple farmer, but you got to go with mathematics. And this, there's a lot of people in the movement that are extremely bright. We have a lot of college professors, a lot of college students, and, they, and they're like, we, we're kind of the dumb farmers of it. And we get along good with everybody, and we respect everybody. But as we talk about there's three to nine million gallons goes in, there's 300 toxic chemicals go in, and all these numbers and all these numbers. And I've noticed crowds are to the point where they're like this, people fall asleep. We've heard it all. We've heard all the numbers. We've checked all the boxes off. We've emailed, we've done our petitions. And what we need to do, it's very simple. This is mathematics. We need a French style revolution. You've done, you've done everything to try to stop the frag. You've put your whole heart and soul into it. You've taken all your free time, like us. And so you at times might have felt hopeless and helpless. Now is the time, if you do anything, I would beg on my hands and knees to everybody here. If you do anything, Saturday, please throw your weight. Tell anybody you want, show up. Let's crank this sucker up to 10,000 people. And, and we can finish this deal off. We can finish this deal off. The French did it. But Albany with, is floating with gas money. And the only way you can short circuit that sucker is you've got to bring the people in. And once they see that, and one day, at the end of the day, the dynamic totally changes. We are on the offensive. And we, we take what's ours. So let me let me let my wife talk some too, because she's we're both, believe it or not, shy, but she's more shy than I am. 
So since I am shy, I'll make this probably two minutes and then I'll be done. Just want to thank you all for coming. Um, no matter which side you're on, I just appreciate you coming. Um, that's why we do this. We were all talking as we're sitting in our little car, all crammed in, all five of us, um, getting cramps in our legs, our knees getting sore and everything. So we should have had a bigger car, but we have our little Ford Escort, the little Ford Escort. And um, you guys are the reason we do this. Um, we love having conversations with you. Um, well, actually, even more than that is the reason we do it is, where did Freckles go? 